we often think of uh, spiritual practices as stuff that we do to connect to a divine source. So we think of things such as going for a walk in nature, having a meaningful conversation with a friend, doing some self-care, because then you feel like you are reminded of what's good inside of you and that therefore is your connection with um, the divine. But we not always think much about the spiritual practices that we do to connect with ourselves and the parts of us that um, need attention and integration as a full uh, being, enlightened being from another dimension. When we come to this earth, we are being invited of integrating certain aspects of ourselves into our consciousness, therefore into the collective consciousness. And by doing this mirror work and these spiritual practices that, that we do as we live are supposed to do that, but often they do not. And while I was going for a walk, I was listening to this amazing podcast by Eckhart. Um, I go for walks. I love walking. And I do different things while I walk. Um, I listen to an audiobook or a podcast. Um, I also practice um, sensorial walk. So I walk engaging myself visually, you know, with um, all the senses and even the feelings, the smells and everything. So I try to do these as spiritual practices, but I then encounter this gem and I just hope to convey here what my understanding was of this um, episode. And it talks about alchemy. It's a, it's an, a fantastic word to be used, alchemy, because alchemy is the transmutation. So if we come from the principle that energy doesn't die, it's never born, it will never die, what happens with energy is it, it transforms itself and it, it gains this characteristic of expanding and that's why we come here to integrate these parts of us that are unseen, are like the dark side of the moon, the shadow. So we bring that to consciousness and we hold space for all of that to happen. So two people come on stage to ask Eckhart questions and one of them tell a story about, hey, I'm a guy and for the past couple of years I've been doing a lot of spiritual work and what I noticed is I am um, kind of cutting ties with relationships to a point where I feel like I am kind of over the top, judgmental, um, but I also feel like for the first time I'm listening to my needs, I'm enforcing my boundaries, I am kind of conducting my life the way I think it works for me but I am seeing all the relationships crumble, including the one with my wife. I've been married for 25 years and we are already living in separate houses because, you know, she has her space. I have my space and it feels like a pull. There's a part of me that just wants to let go. But there's another part of me who is just feeling selfish for doing that. And he d directs the question to Eckhart as to when is time to let go? Because you are not there to enforce anything. You are there to bring it to consciousness. So that thing that it's uncomfortable to you, that thing that has kind of a life of its own, he calls it the pain body. And that's a mind-blowing concept, and I'm going to tell you why. The pain body is like this living, energetic thing, kind of along in your energetic field, uh, walking along with you. That pain body is formed by a cluster of emotions, that of things that happened to you and you were unable to process, a.k.a. trauma. That pain body exists as a memory, and it's interesting because it feeds off of your mind. So it's like um, a gremlin. So it's there at midnight and you do that, you know, that thing and it makes them alive. 
So as you feed, as you give the mind um, more um, tools to uh, drift along, the pain body kind of feeds off of that and lives on. So that pain body, it's not something for you to get rid of. That shadow, it's not something for you to get rid of. It's something for you to gain awareness of. So when they were discussing this situation about the guy, um, you know, when enough is enough, you know, when he, he should get um, divorced, definite divorce, Eckhart says something like, you know, you just, you, you tag along. Th that person is your spiritual practice. And that concept is mind-blowing. Like I said, we think of spiritual practice as good things. But this is a spiritual practice where that person, that unenlightened person, because the guy is claiming that he's doing all this spiritual work and the woman isn't. So they created a space to each other where he has his own space, he does his spiritual stuff, and she doesn't. So he, she feels like it's not something that she wants to do. So that part of him needs to be brought to awareness. There's a part of his energetic field, perhaps his pain body, is kind of making that situation happen so you can look at it. What best way to call your attention? So it could be physical. It could be pain, discomfort in the body. It could be an anticipation of the future or an over living things from the past kind of situation. It could be mental. It could be emotional. Like you, you feel in a certain way in, in different times. It's that pain body kind of bringing you to that discomfort feeling of, hey, I'm attached to you. I'm here. Knock, knock, knock. I'm here. You cannot get rid of me says something to the extent of, you know, you use that person as your spiritual practice to understand more what, what that's calling you for. And if it becomes too much for you, you retract. You just go incognito. He even teased, like, go to your house. He said he got his house to have some space. Go to your house when it's too much. But it's a practice, you see that person not as an enemy. You see that person as an invitation for you to bring alive that part of you that's just being rejected, that's just kind of looked from above um, condescendingly, and it needs attention without judgment. So you're not like shutting he he. He said, like, you do not need to shut her down or separate from her unless you really want to do that. But it's more about creating that spiritual practice of every time that a conflict or something arises where the person does not want to be enlightened or seek um, spiritual exploration. It is that kind of perhaps a discomfort within them that does not accept that to kind of an invitation to come to terms with that. And then it follows with a lady that um, talks about, you know, going from one of his classes home and, you know, kind of thinking about all the good stuff that Eckhart has said and reflecting upon things. And then she perceives that urge of turn on the TV, 8 o'clock, Housewives. She didn't say that, but it was kind of a show on TV that she watches it. So she said that she couldn't hold herself because he, at heart, that day was talking about being still and observing um, kind of, you know, your urges without necessarily attending to them. But she said she couldn't. And she was like, what do I do when I come across a situation where um, – I, I do not have control over myself. I simply do not have control over myself. And I went ahead and I watched the TV show. And he uses the same concept of the addiction. And it's, again, another spiritual practice that we do is to recognize these urges inside of us, uh, not necessarily using the will of power to repress them because we don't want them because they are unwanted, like he referred to for instance, to a situation where a person is addicted to food. So 
you know, it's like food is comfort. So food is something that I can use as a reward or as a punishment, but it is an addiction. If you are overeating or undereating, it's an addiction. It's something that you are pursuing. Food is not to feed you anymore. It's, it, it kind of gains another layer and it becomes this urge that we have to do something or to not do something and lose control of ourselves, not being able to have willpower coming up and shutting it down. And his answer again, well-spoken answer about the fact that willpower is never something that you want to use in a situation like that. It will become resistance. So the more you say no, it will want to come out more. So if you say don't eat, don't eat, don't eat, your brain is like eat, eat, eat. It's that pain body coming alive and you are like, I don't want to see you. I don't want to see you. I don't want to see you. And the thing is like growing, saying, see me, see me, see me. So will of power is pretty much you getting in a corner, closing your eyes like a little child, right? Go away, go away, go away. It never works. So if something inside of you, if your pain body is telling you, see me, the right way of doing is seeing it. And how do you do that? The power of pause. And I've been reflecting on the power of pause so much. So he talks about the power of now, Eckhart. And the power of now is, you know, generically presence, God. The power of pause is a tool that you use, a tool to respond to when this pain body, to when this grambling, to when this medusa that puts you in a trance gives you, kind of arises within you, see me, see me, see me, for you to accept the invitation and look at it. Use that as a spiritual practice. Use that as I am here to see you. I'm not here to agree with you. I'm not here to want you. I'm here to see this aspect of me. It's bringing from subconscious to consciousness. And it's interesting because as you shed light, there's a tendency of it to dissolve because it has been already seen. That's all it wants. It's to be seen. So when he was talking about um, the urge of for her to turn on the TV, the pause is a two-minute pause. You see the urge coming, but instead of immediately, instinctively attend to, go there and turn on the TV, for you to pause, take a moment, and just observe that urge in you. And I feel like a lot of us try to gain understanding, like why is, it, is this a need for me? Why do I need to turn on the TV? What am I trying to hide from or, you know, punishment, like a heart told me not to do that. Why am I doing that? All of that is removed because you were seeing and you were seeing with eyes from lens of a camera. It, it doesn't have judgment. It just sees everything. We are the space where all these things happen, where all these things take place, even the unpleasant things. Um, when he was describing um, the addiction process, I feel like all of us have developed um, some sort of um, addiction to something, food, TV, relationships, um, you know, drugs, uh, medication, um, sex, games. There's so many types of addiction, so many layers of addictions. Phone, being on our phone, social media is an addiction. Um, it kind of made me reflect upon that because we are often ashamed of our urges and we don't want to see them because we kind of condemn them. Like, I'm, a, I'm addicted. Am I addicted to Housewives of New York? We ask ourselves, you know, how foolish is that? So the judgment comes and we shame ourselves for having that urge. That's why you want to push the judgment away and just kind of bring awareness and kindness to see that 
in you, that taking space in you. Um, it happens with relationships, like the case with the guy. It happens with a relationship with the person and a relationship with ourselves and the urge that we have to do something to escape or to reward or the mechanisms that we created within ourselves, um, which are kind of a consequence of our upbringing and potentially even pain bodies, like he said, from other lives. If you believe that, they are kind of trapped into the field. So spiritual practice, and, and when you say, like, what is a spiritual practice? Like I said, we often think of something... Um, like, you know, uh, meditation or journaling or breathing, breath work. And it, those are uh, spiritual practice. But what about the ugly spiritual practice that we have to do when recognizing these ugly uh, fishes coming out of deep ocean looking like fucking aliens looking at you and saying, yeah, I'm your addiction. Or, yeah, I am the person ha that's codependent, cannot finish a relationship, cannot end a relationship, or yeah, I am that ugly person who was never able to um, travel and see the world and live with my parents. And, and instead of projecting that onto the person that you're living with that you don't want to, um, and, you know, going for a walk instead of just completely think of all nature and good things, also reflect upon these issues and put some light onto these parts of ourselves that are often uh, not seen. And the spiritual practice to me gained another layer today, I feel like. And it has this um, understanding that these teachers, these people, these circumstances that happen in my life are trying to show me something. And instead of playing oblivious, like I'm not seeing them and scrolling just like we do it with our phones, um, you know, the video has a minute and person spoke 15 seconds, we like move on, don't want it. Instead of that, um, kind of move on, move on, move on and instinctively reacting to thing, we pause and respond. And we don't need to respond with will of power, taking an action. We respond just, hmm. We, we gain awareness. The response is awareness. Not what I do. What is this? What's going on? It's like, mmm. Mmm. And awareness is the first thing. And I feel like as the pain body gets seen, it's almost like when you shed light on a vampire. It just starts like melting and crinkling and getting all like not able to handle light, and eventually explodes and creates this alchemy of bringing it all together. Because if it is a pain body and it's distinctively kind of separate, and I like to feel like the pain body is like a parasite. Like I said, it feeds off of your mind. That's the image I got in my head. Um, it's a parasite. So if you kind of give space to that parasite and recognizes it's there, and potentially shedding light on it for something beautiful to come out of it. And that's the power we have. We hold space for this parasite to come in, feed off of you, of your energy, and then kind of by scanning and shedding light upon all fragmentations of yourself, you shed light on it, and it creates this transmutation where the parasite is seen, and then you lived it through its cycle. It showed you something about yourself. And the light wasn't there before. Now the light is there. So it expands your field of awareness of your own, um, the majestic, your own majestic being. So as you see that, the parasite, you know, crumbles into the ground. And it creates um, uh, uh, organic material for something beautiful to come out, like a rose or anything you want to plant there. So I, I just felt, felt the call to come here and talk about this in my own language and how I processed it because I feel like in my life those things apply. Relationships that I have many times come to a point where me and this person, we, we're not going to be able to come to a common ground because we inherently have core beliefs, core values that are different right? How can this relationship move forward? This guy had a 
a question like that. Like, how can I have a friend that ha that has core beliefs that are different than mine? And that person is a spiritual practice. My dogs uh, are a spiritual practice, and I find it amazing when I think about that. My dogs are Jack Russells, right? So they are so energetic, and they kind of a push me to be active, to give them what they need. And sometimes I get frustrated. I just want to kick back. And I feel like they are my spiritual practice. Um, they pull me to move when I don't want to move. And I pull them to calm down when I want to calm down. So it's not like a, a one-way road. I have a communication with this part of myself. It's not there only to take you are also kind of shedding light on it. So the times when I am trying to ground and feel like I need to move uh, I, and go in nature, they will look at me like I need a walk. And then if I am in a position where I am more um, needing some time off, some pause, some reflection, I will invite them to cuddle with me and just calm down and be there for me like, I, you know, like we are for each other. So... By reflecting on these things on a practical level, he brought me the desire of coming here and uh, talking on my own way and words, how I see this in my life addiction-wise with food. Uh, sugar is a big one. I go to sugar. Sugar is like that thing that's always calling me. It gives me that comfort. But right after um, I eat a lot of sugar, I feel very, very shitty. Sugar kind of creates this... Uh, lack of balance inside my body and the insulin spikes and then all the other hormones are trying to coagulate what the fuck's going on here and then it takes a couple of days for my body to catch up and during these couple of days I'm thinking of myself with judgment like why did I eat the sugar like why you know it's an addiction you have to remove all sugar remove all sugar and you create all these like plans in your mind that you're going to make a bake a cake that has no sugar and you start looking into xylitol. And it's like, yes, and the, the thing is just kind of arising from consciousness saying, see me, see me, see me, sugar. Why are you, why do you want sugar? Can you pause two minutes before grabbing the cookie and just thinking about like, why am I getting this fucking sugar? Because every time I do that, it creates more awareness. Oh, my God, I'm going to feel so shitty in a couple of days. I'm going to be all wacky and constipated with too much sugar. I don't want that. I don't want that. Marie's a peer. You kind of reason with yourself. That conversation is can only happen within the space where the shadow is brought up. You see it. You gain awareness. And you pause. And you pause. Mm, I like that. Mm. It's kind of a an acknowledgement. Mm. You there? You there? Kiddo who wants all the jollies? Huh? I see you. Sour patch. A whole bag. That's what you want. I see you. Not good or bad. It's just, yeah, it's there. And I feel like this layer comes first. Awareness. See me, see me, see me. I see you. I see you. I see the fear. I see the judgment. I see this crying loud child. I see the addicted. I see the codependent. I see all these parts of myself that are ugly. I see you. Then you can step onto the other layers of what is that entails. And I feel like obviously a professional might be able to assist you better. But the awareness is just straightforward. And Eckhart, during this episode, uh, reflects perfectly on things that profoundly resonate with me. And I hope it was uh, joyful for you to see that these parts of you are not something for you to be ashamed of. And willpower won't cure them. Or it's not something for you to be healed uh, in a sense of getting rid of it. It's just something for you to just live through, kind of integrate, and within those moments of pause, gaining more and more awareness of your choices and your decisions and kind of reflecting upon experience and creating the life that works um, better for you and the life that works better for you usually is a life where you are living as a whole, as a whole 
bringing all these um, shadow aspects, all these uh, unwanted aspects, the pain body. It, it is the parasite gremlin body. If you don't look at it, it will just feed of it, of your mind, and just take over control over your, or your whole house. But as you contain them, as you make sure you don't feed them, during these pause moments, you can tell that you are able to see things from different perspectives. It might be able that you just run through the red light and go for the jollies and eat the whole shit or eat the whole bag of Cheerios. It doesn't matter. You just went through. It's not something for you to be like, oh, I fucking failed. I, I, I told myself that Sunday, you know, it was going to start my diet. It's just like, hmm, there's a part of myself that really needed comfort or there's a part of myself that's really struggling. There's a part of myself that might be feeling overwhelmed. There's a part of myself that is not feeling important or worthy or rejected. Like, what's going on? What's going on here? And that's going to be a grounds for uh, more episodes. But this one was this phenomenal reflection that Eckhart brought to me today. It will carry over. Um, through the day um, resonating inside of me and I hope resonating inside of you too.